very warm welcome to 52 weeks, 52 scientists. The final ancient scientist of our very first season, episode 13, is John Philopolis. John wraps up our list of scientists from the year 500 and before. This is an important episode because this marks the end of antiquity and the lighting of the fire of the Middle Ages. In the chain reaction of more liberal scientists of medieval times, he was the ancient first reaction to set this off. It is important to understand him in order to have a better view of all of the Middle Ages. The medieval line of thinking did not magically appear. It was the result of the thoughts of those in the ancient period. John was also known as John the Grammarian and John of Alexandria. He was born in the year 490 in the sunny city of Alexandria, which if you are a regular watcher of his show, is home to several great scientists who are Philoponus's contemporaries. Like our latest entry, Ptolemy, he was also of possible Roman descent slash a Hellenized native and spoke Latin or an Alexandrian dialect of that language. This cluster of years around the turn of the eras has had many Egyptian Roman scientists. He was edgy and controversial and a hard-working original thinker. John didn't create any huge important invention or discover an important discovery as a whole. But his thinking and how he shaped Neoplatonism is why he is featured on the show. He challenged several notions of his time period and stood as the Advocatus Diaboli or devil's advocate against the popular methodologies of this time. He challenged many Aristotelian neoplatonic theories as well. He influenced the rise of empiricism against assumptions and fostered a widespread belief that sensory knowledge triumphed over writing, that sensory information triumphs over written data, and that one must experience something to understand the truth about it. He projected proposed a theory of empectus, which was a second theory that seek to explain projectile motion against gravity. He introduced this particular theory and Norodin Bitroji, Ibn Asina, one of our future episodes, and other medievals elaborated it. The theory of impetus is similar to the modern theory of inertia, as explained in Isaac Newton's first law of physics. He accepted the Aristotelian logic that an object has the tendency to stay in one state, which Aristotle thought was rest, but added that a moving object would tend to move and an object that isn't moving won't tend to move. Later in his life, John turned to the religion of Christianity. Before moving forward with the theological part of the life of John Philoponus, who was an important theologian, I'd like to take a moment to disclaim that I won't be taking the biased stance here. Instead, maintaining neutrality as if I were on a discussion on science. Coming back to the topic, he became an apologetic. An apologetic is a Christian who focuses their faith and religion on defenses of the conceptual objections to a particular part of Christianity. They read the books of Bible and study it so they can prove objections wrong. He was an apologetic. His main work as an apologetic was related to the Genesis creation myths and the debate on the eternity of the universe. He was defensive of the Genesis creation myths and supported the mortality of the universe. I'll explain both these concepts to the best of my abilities. The Genesis creation myth is not in the sense what myth usually means. Like in the context of Norse mythology or Egyptian mythology, which means something that is false. Here it means something historical, but interpreted in a symbolic and supernatural manner, and so it is not the cold hard truth. In the Judeo-Christian book of Genesis, part of the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament, there are two stories in sequence which form the first two chapters of the book. They're basically what Bible believes about the start of universe. In the first chapter story, Elohim, the Israeli term for God of indeterminate religion, creates the universe in six days and then blesses and gives sanctity to it in the seventh. This is what the people call Sabbath. In the seventh chapter slash story, Yahweh, God, but this time in a Jewish context, creates Adam as the first man from 
dust and puts him in the biblical garden of Eden and then creates Eve as the first woman from him. Now these stories put focus on the oneness which philosophically you could call monotheism of God and that polytheism is wrong. While it draws parallels to ancient Mesopotamian theology, it also critiques this, which makes the book, like a lot of religious books, a bit more confusing and contradictory. Creationism, which is a controversial pseudo-scientific religious theory, uses the Genesis creation myth as an argument against evolution. But that is irrelevant in this context, and you should subscribe so you know when the Darwin video comes out. Get it? He wrote for another Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic belief, which has the non-eternity of the world. The mostly accepted Big Bang hypothesis explains that the universe hasn't existed for infinite ion, eons, but will not die away, like a ray with a star but not an end. The Abrahamic narrative in this context is that the existence of the universe is fully finite and that the nothing but God existed before the six days. But then the universe will wrap up itself sometimes, collapse. This is a theory that he propagated. He was also a Christologist writer. So he was a Christian who not only practiced but actually studied his religion. I think that is a scientist he didn't let his religion and theological leanings impact him very much actually it is the obverse which is important if you're religious apparently the imperial church didn't think of john as a good christian and nearly a hundred years after he died he was condemned as a heretic like many other scientists including the fabulous nicholas copernicus for his triesthetic interpretation of the christian trinity Basically, he interpreted the Trinity, the three gods of certain sects of Christianity, as without any unity. The Imperial Church believed the Trinity, Yahweh, the Virgin Mary, and Jesus Christ, to be united in the divine sense, but he interpreted it as three gods. The Imperial Church believed that there were three elements forming one god. He was given the name John at birth, but Philopness is a title, a byname or epithet. Just like Mohan Gandhi is Mahatma Gandhi. It means lover of toil or diligent. He was such, but this epithet probably refers to Myophysitism. Because the big shots at the church condemned him, his works were limited. But like all great scholars, the works, they spread. For example, his The Contra Aristotelium resurfaced in medieval Europe. But this was because it first got translated to Arabic from when it was quoted by Simplicius of Cilicia. Arabic philosophers Ibn Rushd, Ibn Sina, Al-Farabi, and Al-Ghazali debated the book extensively, which then influenced Bonaventura, who wasn't condemned but actually canonized. <laughs> and Jean Buridan in Christian Western Europe. Not only Muslim and Christian philosophers, but Jewish Rabbanites, such as Malmonides and Varsanites, used and cited his work frequently against the Karaites. This was his widespread reach. He stands as one of the most excellent theologians regarding uh, not what he believed in, but what his analysis was. He's one of the most excellent and most popular theologians to exist. His works were debated extensively in Arabic scientific and philosophical circles, but John was known as Yahya al-Nahwi, or John the Grammarian. In the quotes of the Shiite Fatimid Imams, like Al-Hakim bi Allah and Hamiduddin Kirmani and Hamza Ali, his anti-Aristotelian logic was defended by philosophers. Many Italian scientists, years later, were influenced by his critique of the Aristotelian Physics. Some of the top names to frequently cite him, cite him include Giovanni Pico de Mila, della Mirandola and future episode Galileo Galilei. He may or not may not have been born into a Christian household, but that is the most that is known about his early life. In fact, most of his life before starting publication and as a prominent pupil remains unknown to most people. He first started publication in the year 510. His teacher was the Neoplatonic scholar Ammonius Hermaiae, of, of whom he was a pupil and Ammonusis, 
the predecessor to a model legal type was kind of a guy who writes what is dictated by the employer. His initial thinking was based on the lectures by his teacher Ammonius, but soon enough, the independent thinker John had taken place of the pupil of Ammonius John, and this was when he developed his more brilliant theories. He first critiqued the Aristotelian on the soul and physics. He rejected Aristotelian dynamics and instead proposed a theory of impetus, which I explained previously. And this was an insightful theory which influenced the discovery of inertia, but it was too radical to be approved of his own time. We see John refute an Aristotelian claim in his code. But this view of Aristotle is completely erroneous, and our view might be completely corroborated by actual observation more effectively than by any other sort of verbal argument. For if you let fall from the same height two weights, one may need times heavier than the other, you will see that the ratio of the times required for the motion does not depend slowly on the weight, but the difference in time is very small. He is only known writer out of many in the period known as antiquity that proposed a theory of impetus. Had he invented the concept of inertia, French theoretical physicist Pierre Durham argues, would put Philip and Nesaga among the great geniuses of antiquity and the principal precursors to modern science. In the year 529, at the age of 39, he wrote against the eternity of the universe. This was a major theme in his work in the following decade, which kept him preoccupied thoroughly. This was one of the theories forming the basis of the pagan attack on Christianity. He introduced to a world, and this is why we decided to close off this portion of the season with him, a theory that influenced global philosophical and physics thought radically. Three ideas. The universe is the product of one God, that all the heavens and all the earth are the same in its basics, and that the stars are not divine. Of course, he went after one of his several philosophical rivals, rivals Simplicius of Cilicia, on these philosophical properties and physical properties that he had established. And this was because Simplicius was kind of a follower of Aristotelian cosmology and physics. He argued that motion can occur in a void and the velocity of a certain falling object does not depend on how heavy it is. He argued that God created the whole matter with its physical properties and with the natural laws that would allow matter to progress from a state of chaos to an organized state forming the present universe. If we piece together and analyze his commentary, we know that John followed the didactic method, which contrasts experiential learning a bit, and that he performed genuine experiments. My man had true love at first sight for science. A story for the ages. As a book reviewer, I know many people who have solid books, but their prose just makes them that bad. John's style in radicalism was focal to his unpopularity, and around 530, just a year after his work against eternity of the universe, he switched fields from philosophy to theology. Around the age of 60, John wrote on the creation of the world as a commentary on the Genesis creation myth, which I have already explained, taking in from earlier Greek commentators, including Basil the Great. He transferred his earlier theory of impetus over to the motion of the planets, where he proposed different explanations for motion of celestial objects and that of earthly projectiles. Even though he was a theological work, its contents are recognized as the worst work in scientific history to attempt to present a unified theory of dynamics. Around the age of 63, he contributed theological doctrines on Christology to the Church of Constantinople. His doctrine on the duality of Jesus Christ coincides with the Myf Maya Phyzite school of creation thought. He wrote on the Trinity as well. His self-proclaimed magnum opus or greatest work was greatest work was the Arbiter. This book stands in line with Saint Cyril and Severus of Antioch. He asserted that Christ as divine as human and refuting a middle ground such as the one proposed by Chalcedonian authors. He was around eighty years when he died, also although we don't know how this great figurine in philosophy died. He wrote at least forty works, but this is a flowing list, and pardon my terrible pronunciation of Latin. On words with different meanings and the virtue of a difference of accent, they were Kabulus, Koi, 
diversam significatum exhibit secundum differentium accentus. Commentary on Aristotle's On Generation and Corruption. Commentary on Aristotle's De Anima. Commentary on Aristotle's Categories. Commentary on Aristotle's Prior Analytics. Commentary on Aristotle's Posterior Analytics. Commentary on Aristotle's Physics. Floppiness's most important commentary, in which he challenges Aristotle on things like time, space, white matter, and dynamics. Yeah, that was fun to pronounce. Commentary on Aristotle's Meteorology. Commentary on Nicomachus' Introduction to Arithmetic. On the Eternity of World Against Proclus. The Alternity Mundi Contra Proclam. On the Eternity of the World Against Aristotle. The Alternity Mundi Contra Aristotelium. A refutation of Aristotle's doctrine of the fifth element and the eternity of motion and time, consisting of at least eight books. On the creation of the world, the Opifico Mundi, a theological philosophical commentary on the creation story in the book of Genesis. On the contingency of the world, the Contingentia Mundi. On the use and construction of the astrolabe, which is the oldest extant Greek treatise on the astrolabe. Arbitre, or the Atikes, a philosophical justification of monophysitism. Not extant in Greek, Syriac text we have with some Latin translation. On the Trinity, the Trinity, the main source for a reconstruction of his Trinitarian doctrine. After his death, he was declared to have heretical views of the Trinity and was made anathema at the Third Council of Constantinople in 680 to 681. This limited the spread of his ideas in the following centuries, but in his own time and afterwards, he was translated into Syriac and Arabic, and many of his words were survived. Some of his works continued to circulate in Greek or Latin words and influenced Bonaventure. The theory of impetus was taken up by Buridan in the 14th century. Floponus and his contemporaries, Simplicius of Cilicia and Strato, developed the Aristotelian concept of space further, eventually influencing the Renaissance theory of perspective, particularly the one highlighted by Leon Battista Alberti and other architectural masters. John was fearless, untiring, and devoted and has truly made a dent in the history of science. And thus we end this chapter of the history of science. Here in the first season of 52 scientists, 52 weeks. Moving on to the Middle Ages. As always, we request you to support the channel by subscribing to it and clicking the bell icon. If you like the video, uh, like and share it. And tell us how you felt through the comments. Bye-bye. Up next, we have somebody on our show from the, for the first time from our, my country and for the first time from the medieval era. Yes.